I am going to talk with you this afternoon about the future of customer experience and what we, the analysts and the, the experts in this area, think is, is coming. And so even though the title of my talk today is around the future of customer experience, what we are going to talk about mostly is the rise of the machines or the coming of the bots and how that's going to play out in financial services. But before I do that, what I would love to do and is very important to do, um, particularly in this beautiful uh, environment that we are in here in Sydney, is to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And I pay my respects to their ancestors past and present and also like to warmly welcome and acknowledge any Indigenous people in the room with us today. So, um, let's get started and think about, when we use this term customer experience, what it is that we're actually talking about. So who in the room is, is confident that when we're talking about customer experience, you will actually know by definition what it is? Who's uh, very confident? One-ish person. Typically, that's about right. There's about one person in the room who goes, yeah, I kind of get what customer experience is. So let's look at what it is, why it's important, and what is upon us now that's radically going to change the way we in financial services deliver customer experience and what role the rise of robotics is going to have in that. So I get extremely excited about this topic because we have not seen anything that's going to change and shift the financial services sector as much as the, the maturity of artificial intelligence and the coming of the machines since the internet arrived about 20 odd years ago. So let's just get on the same page about what customer experience is first, and then we're going to look at some of the trends that are going to uh, impact us and impact you and the, the work that you do in and around your customers. So when we're talking about customer experience, what we're really talking about is an individual's perception of an experience they have with your organization or your business across six different categories. And when an individual human processes this, they're thinking of it not from a segment that they belong to, but from their personal or individual perspective. So typically, they, they have an interaction with, with perhaps you as a mortgage broker, and they go, what was the communication I had from that broker? Was it suitable to me as an individual? Did it come through the, the channel that is suitable to me? Was it targeted specific for, specifically for me as an individual? Number one, communication. Number two, is the product or service suitable for me as an individual? Three, is the process that I undertake with that organisation, the processes I use, is it easy and does it suit how I want to do business with this company or this person. Four is the channel. Was this distributed? And then am I interacting in a channel that I like? I like to use a video channel, or I like to use social media, or I like to do face-to-face, -face, or I like to do voice. Is the channel suitable to me? Fifth category of customer experience is how do the people at that organisation relate to me individually? Are we aligned with our personality and our values? And then the sixth category of customer experience is what is the value of all of those five things we've just talked about? Communications, product, service, process, channel, people. What is the value to me in two regards? What is the value for the effort that I've put in in interacting with this mortgage broker? And what is the value for money that I'm getting from this particular um, interaction, but beyond the product and service? All five of the categories before. So you can see, actually, customer experience is not just having happy customers or customers that will recommend you. Customer experience is actually quite scientific. Now, why has financial services companies been a bit terrible at providing really good customer experience. And that is because, essentially, the way business and financial services uh, businesses were built are based on industrial models, 
and humans are based on psychological, emotional, and human models. And the two things were never designed or to, to work together. So what we have now is a shift away from the industrial models of previous times towards a model of what we call individualization. So if we think about where things started in customer experience, it was mass production. Then it moved to uh, mass customization. Then it moved to segmentation, into personalization, which is the area we've been in um, for the last maybe three years, and now into what we call individualization. So if we look at that, it's gone sort of from the mass end right through to now where your customers expect you to know them and go through that complete customer experience um, six, uh, I was going to say six quadrant, that doesn't work so well, six uh, category experience with them as individuals. Now, if we look at what um, segmentation means, segmentation is we would put customers in a, in a big segment. So in this room, there might be three segments of customers, and we as a financial institution might treat you all as one in that segment. But we as humans know that I'm actually very different to this lady in the front row. We're actually very different. Should we be in the same segment? Mm, it's easy for organisations to put us there, but practically it's not that useful. Personalization is the coming of big data where the, uh, the data is collected and organizations use the data to predict what it is that I might want to, to buy or use. So that's personalization, that's sort of targeted sales and marketing. But we've now moved beyond that into this area of individualization where customers will expect to be treated, to be known, to have products designed or delivered to them, to have all of those six parts of customer experience delivered to them as individuals. Now, that is ridiculously hard to do, and financial services companies have really struggled to do that because they were never set up to do that. So we're at this kind of really interesting time in history now where finally artificial intelligence has come of age. So artificial intelligence has been around for, uh, since the 1960s, and we're just seeing a time now where it's coming to almost be commoditized. So you've seen the big players like Apple, Google, uh, Microsoft, Amazon, coming out and having open sourced algorithms and artificial intelligence and machines that you can actually just get for free and develop your own, uh, your own robots, your own virtual assistants, your own um, automated processes. So it is an absolutely critical time in where financial services is going to uh, evolve based on this maturity of AI. And AI has become mature for really only one reason, and that is that the computing capacity of, um, of the world's um, computers and supercomputers is at the uh, maturity now where it can actually compute um, these huge amounts of data very quickly. So AI has matured, uh, it's been around for, for many years, matured because of the power of computers now. So what are the analysts predicting with regard to the coming of machines in financial services. So we look at Gartner, so Gartner, a large IT analyst, reports that by 2019, so two years away, 40% of enterprises, particularly financial services, will be using virtual assistants to interact with customers from needs and requirements, sales, onboarding, claims, renewals, upsell and cross-sell, we'll be using virtual assistants to, to deliver that, those experiences to customers. By 2022, it's predicted that 30% of all customer interactions in financial services will in fact be conducted by machines. So let's step back and see what else is going on, and then I'm going to dive into the machines 
the machine learning, artificial intelligence, big data, and see how that's going to play out. And then we're going to talk about how that might play out in the work that you do in, um, in mortgages. So these are um, seven big trends that are happening in technology at the moment. So the first one we call ambient computing. So ambient computing is anything to do with the um, physical environment that you're sitting, living, or working in. So ambient computing is like the connected home. So when you go home, you might have, so Google Nest is a, um, an ambient computing capability that would be in, that you have in your home. And as you walked into your home, it detects that it's uh, Katrina who's arrived home and sets all the settings in the house, the, the music, the lights, the um, um, blinds, etc., to the setting that I like. And so ambient computing uh, will be anything that sets environments for humans suited to the individual. The next big trend we're seeing is around platforms. So this is the coming of platforms as opposed to what we call pipeline businesses. So platform businesses are typically those that have multiple sides to them. So Uber is a platform business, Airbnb a platform business. And so what we typically think is that these platform businesses might be from the, the startups or the early stage companies, but actually we're starting to see that a lot of the big financial services enterprises are building platforms within their own inf infrastructure, IT infrastructure. So we will see a lot more marketplace type platforms um, arising. Third one is smart machines, which we're going to talk and, and delve into a bit today, which is really um, the coming of machines that can do three things. They are intelligent only in the sense that they can learn. They're actually not um, intelligent in the way we think about um, IQ. They can, uh, they have uh, an ability to learn and they have ability to be able to predict. Then the digital mesh. So the digital mesh is a different way that we think about the way everything is connected using IT. So digital mesh is around how the internet of things, so how devices and people are connected through a mesh rather than through standalone um, servers or individual um, technology stacks. Predictive analytics, another big tech trend, which is starting to say, instead of just analyzing data that's in the past, what we really want to do is analyze data and do uh, predictive analytics on what customers are going, how they're going to behave in the future. It's not useful anymore just having looking at what customers are doing in the past. Now, cybersecurity and ethics is a massive topic that we're talking about. So my office is based in New York. I spend a lot of time in uh, San Francisco. And cybersecurity and ethics is now said in the same breath as anything to do with customer experience. So we call it having a culture of security hand in hand with anything to do with customer experience. So this is customer data privacy, etc. And then the Internet of Things, this is connected devices. So at the moment we're seeing um, th uh, the rise of things such as Alexa, um, who is a personal assistant that might be at someone's home, connected with the fridge, connected with Uber, connected with Spotify, connected with a human. So the Internet of Things also are really about to start to change the way we think about machines versus humans. That was um, just a quick definition of artificial intelligence. Machines, simply a machine that learns. So what are we saying machine learning is going to do in the next few years? So again, if we look at some of Gartner's statistics, we will see that within um, uh, three years, 20% 20, uh, 20 of content that's available on the internet will be generated by machines. It will not be, need human involvement. We'll see that three million workers will be supervised by robo-advisors. There will be 50% of companies, fast-moving companies, who have more machines conducting interactions than they have humans conducting interactions. 
2 million employees by 2020 required to wear wearable tech. And then the one that sort of gets a little bit starting to get, oh, are we comfortable with this, is that 5% of all economic transactions conducted within the world conducted outside the scope of humans even having knowledge that these transactions are being undertaken. So, it's exciting, but it's a little bit scary. So what I would, uh, what I'm going to do now is just talk to you a little bit about the, what we're seeing in financial services and the rise of virtual assistants. And then I'm going to get you to have a little bit of a think and a talk about what you're feeling about this, what you're feeling about the coming of the machines. So again, if we look at um, what 2017 represents, is really the year of artificial intelligence and bot strategy. So most of the large financial services uh, institutions are starting to work out how they can deploy and test and learn and experiment with virtual assistants or, or chat, chat bots. And if we look again at what the analysts are predicting, um, there's an order of industries that are likely to be, have their jobs automated and using things such as uh, chatbots and virtual assistants, and that is this. Um, and the prediction is that 40% of these jobs within the next 10 years will be conducted by a chatbot. So the one that we've developed is called Rosie. There is Amelia, Julie, Amy, they, they tend to be um, uh, women's names, like, I'll talk about that in a little minute. Um, but 40% of jobs conducted by these machines within the next 10 years. First uh, industry that should have automation occur, what do you think it might be? Retail, number one, followed by hospitality, number two, just don't say acting. No, no, whatever you say, no acting replacement, please. It's, life is well, hard. Well, Rob, I've seen you today. Your acting was a bit robotic, I have to say, <laughs> this morning. <laughs> you are way too smart for me to say anything back to you. <laughs> Four, insurance. Five, banking and finance. 40% of jobs in the next 10 years to be conducted by machines and not by humans. So, let's just stop there for a second. Let's see if I've cleverly actually put the right slide. Yes, I did. Brilliant. I would love each of you, please, just the person next to you, have a chat for a minute and just reflect on your feelings about what I've talked about. So I'm saying we're at a time where things are changing, probably it's never been quite um, as, as exciting or challenging as when the internet first arrived. How are you feeling about the things I've talked about today? That the bots are here, and they're not even coming, they're here, and we're going to see a lot more human technology interaction. How are you feeling? Let's go three ways that you might be feeling. You might be super excited about that. This might be your dream come true. You might have watched Westworld or um, some other of those AI films and you're like very excited about it. You may not be that excited and you might just need more information and you're sort of sitting on the fence, I don't really know, do I love the bots, do I not love the bots, not sure. Or you might be not feeling very happy or comfortable at all. And we always have people in the room that go, not happy with this, don't like it, and these are the reasons. So let's go person next to you, just one minute. Do you love the bots? Do you need more information? Not happy about the coming of the machines? Let's go. And let's start with the group who may have felt, yeah, I don't know, I don't know that I'm really excited about it, I don't know that I'm really worried about it, and I'm sitting in the middle, I'm just not sure. How many of you are sitting in the middle, not exactly sure how you feel about it? Put your hand right up so we can see. Okay, yeah, good number. So that's probably almost, you know, a good quarter of the audience. Okay. How many of you not happy or not feeling comfortable? Okay, hands up. 
Okay, a little bit less, maybe a fifth of the room, but good. And we're going to come back and explore that. And how many of you, when you knew I was going to talk about robots are coming and the machines and human technology interacting, got super excited and went, yeah, I love the bots, I'd like to see more of them, I'm excited about the future. Yeah, not quite as excited as I am. Um, but a good number, in fact, probably slightly just more than the other groups. And this is typically what we get in any time I, I talk about um, the coming of the bots on the machines. It's like, hmm, slightly most people are kind of interested and excited. Good chunk of you want more information. And there's quite a few of you not so super happy about it. So let's just see if we can unpack that a bit with the audience. Um, I would like to speak to someone who's sitting in the middle, not exactly sure. Um, whether they're happy or not too happy about it. Who would like to just jump up, tell me their name, where they're from, and tell me why they're sort of sitting on the middle? What, what are your thoughts? Lots of, lots of questions spring to mind. Yeah. Um, whether you'd still be able to, in a practical sense, we were just talking about a mortgage broker submitting an application, would in artificial intelligence be able to replace a human in framing that application in the most favourable way? Right, not sure, not sure. Let's talk about that in a few minutes' time. Great, so the question, not sure whether it would be able to be useful in an application? Thank you. Okay, um, who is not too happy or does not really that comfortable about the, the coming of machines and machines perhaps uh, potentially doing a lot of the percentage of customer interactions? Who, who is like not too happy? Were you not happy? You happy? You not happy? Do you want to talk about it? <laughs> this is like a counselling session. Okay, I'd love you to talk about. It. Would you love to talk about it? Great. Can you stand up so everyone can stare at you? And can you tell us your I'm name? Happy. Where? <laughs> and what's your name and where are you from? Um, Brendan from Queensland. Happy about Queensland. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Got to pay it. Um, I'm just probably of the mind that. Um, there's a lot of high tech out there, but I think people and consumers like high touch. I'm a person I would rather have a human interaction than a computer interaction. Okay, good. So you think still humans are perhaps better at doing the work? Yeah, I think so, because that way at least if I get a name of a person, I can make them accountable. So if they give me the wrong answer, I'll be back to have a conversation with them, whereas the computer hides behind the mask of technology and, yeah. and uh, I don't think you'd get a favourable outcome. Okay. Good to know. Thank you for sharing. Okay, who is excited about it? Who's pretty pumped that they're... Bo right, right, straight down here, that hand up. I didn't even finish my sentence. Your hand was up. Brilliant. Thanks. I'm Greg Davies from Tweed Heads, surrounded by Queenslanders. Yeah, it's a lot of you. <laughs> I'm really excited, and I bet everybody in the room's had an experience where you ring up, why is the assessor not processed my file? Oh, they're sick. And they didn't do it. We haven't allocated it. There's 19 days until you hit the assessment queue. Hmm. A bot would just nail it. The same policy for every single loan you put in. And they're only going to take 40% of those spots, and it's the assessors out there that are going to lose their job first. <laughs> I'm, I'm, the, I'm sick, and I'm a mortgage broker. I've got that personal touch. They're not yeah. going to put a bot in an Uber to go to somebody's house at night yeah. to do some ID and sort out what's going on in their life. So yeah. mine's safe. The back end should be botted to hell. It's yeah. <laughs> I love that. Botted to hell. Well done. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, so that's what we're really seeing. So the, the bots of machine learning capability should be taking away about 30% of the more tedious, mundane, routine type tasks that you in the financial services sector might do. So um, quick example, we are doing, implementing one of our bots, oh, Rosie is our machine, and she's being used uh, in the US by uh, three Fortune 100 companies, uh, one to do auto insurance sales, one to do retirement product sales, and one to do life insurance sales. And essentially what Rosie can do, if I talk you through the um, retirement product, this is nationwide insurance, one of the largest insurers in the world. Rosie, a customer will come to the website, they're trying to um, 
search for a retirement product and they want to buy it online, they don't actually want to necessarily deal with a human, but retirement is a complex product. So I can't do it typically online through a web form myself as a customer because it's, it's too complicated. And we know across the world that the typical sales conversion rates of selling financial services online is about 1% to 2%. Everywhere we go, America, Asia, Australia, where we're doing this work, sales are about 1% to 2% if customers are trying to do it online themselves. Because they, it's high effort, they don't understand it, it's decision-making fatigue, and they're not confident in what they're buying. So where, did, where are sales done really well, or where are customer interactions done really well? It's where there's a, typically a conversation. So what happened in the, when the internet arrived and everyone went, oh, we have to do everything online and do it on the web and do it digitally, the people that were designing that, the technologists, this comes as no surprise to anyone, forgot that conversation is actually a really important thing in how humans do business and how humans interact. So we dropped all the conversation off, left that in the call centre, or left that for you guys to do in face-to-face, -face, and just automated the hell out of the, the application form online, forgetting that it's actually a really difficult customer experience. So what customers want is immediate help and explaining of information, explaining of the product and the premium, etc. So what the bots will do, what the virtual assistants will do, so we call it a cognitive virtual assistant. The word cognitive just means artificial in, artificially intelligent. Virtual means it's digital. And assistant, it's going to guide a customer through. What um, Rosie will do is actually a customer will land on the website. Um, they'll, they'll have a, a tile there that says, would you like to be guided through, or like our virtual assistant to guide you through your um, purchase experience today or your application for your retirement, and Rosie actually guides customers through their full purchase journey. So that will be, here is the product, what questions do you, the customer, have on it, here is what um, the product covers, here is a quotation, here is an application form, and I, Rosie, will now take your payment. The machine can actually handle all of that, can even handle the customer goes, oh, I want to change my beneficiary or I want to change my term or my premium, and the robot can actually be configured to handle all those things in the platform. So what we know is that the, this can be done quite effectively because what this is is what's called artificial narrow intelligence. So there's three types of artificial intelligence. Artificial narrow intelligence, artificial general intelligence, and artificial super intelligence. So artificial narrow intelligence is what Rosie does, or the, the virtual assistants that you will start to see more and more of used in financial services. The narrow intelligence means that Rosie actually needs to only understand the client company, so let's go use nationwide, nationwide, a retirement product, and the type of questions a customer is going to ask about the nationwide retirement product. So she's very narrow in her context, and so she can learn very quickly all the questions a typical customer has at that particular narrow band of the customer journey. And then she can do three things. She can have a conversation, she can make a decision, and she can guide customers to the next step on their journey where she does the same thing. She uses that narrow band of learning and she learns every time a customer goes through the journey, she learns and becomes more, more clever at answering people's questions until she guides them all the way through to payment. So this narrow intelligence, very, very mature now. So then there's artificial general intelligence, which is the series, the Cortana's, the Alexa's. So these are machines that have to know what the weather is, what the football score is, how to order an Uber, um, how to play music at home. That's artificial general intelligence. And that's quite mature, but it's probably two years away from uh, Siri or Alexa or Cortana actually being able to answer any question that we have. And then we've got artificial super intelligence. So if I go back to these first two, narrow and general intelligence, these can do things that humans can do. They can automate 
processes and things that we do. Artificial superintelligence is things that humans, we can think beyond the capacity that humans can think. So artificial superintelligence is um, sort of earmarked for around 2025 to 2030. So, so 10 to 15 years away, where we have these supercomputers that can actually do much, much, much more than what we as humans can do. But narrow intelligence, general intelligence, quite mature now. So we see that 30% of an average financial service um, person, uh, perhaps even brokers, work could be supported by having a virtual assistant in place. Now, in the way we do it, our platform could be used in human-to-human -human mode, so you could actually have a human uh, employee or, say, a mortgage broker and a human customer going through a journey um, to sell mortgage, and the machine can just learn from that. She can sit in the background and learn from it. And then she can work in what I'm most excited about, which is called Harvard mode, Human Assisted Virtual Assistance, H-A-V-A, -A, Harvard mode. So Harvard is what we expect to be the real shift in the next two years that we see in broker firms and in financial services firms. And this is where the human, us, and the machines, the virtual assistants, work together. And so you would have a buddy who is a machine, and the machine would have a buddy who's a human. And together, you train each other to do the best work you can on behalf of your customer. So an example here might be um, of the percentage that you guys do in mortgage broking that is um, just providing customers information, answering their basic questions, um, what percentage of your job or your staff's job might be just that sort of um, basic routine providing information or answering questions to customers? What sort of percentage would that be? 20? 30? Great. Typically, it's always about 30% that we think the virtual assistants can assist. After hours servicing, after hours information provision, um, the, the virtual assistant walking customers through after hours and then setting up an appointment for them to have a conversation with the broker the next day. So about 30% is what we typically see is what the virtual assistants can do when they're paired with a human to actually start to provide a better customer experience. So the virtual assistants, typically if you use virtual assistants for guided selling and guided onboarding, will save about 30% of calls into call centers or inquiries from customers, plus increase the productivity or the efficiency of the broker or the human by about 20%. So we're really seeing the, the great interest that we'll see in bots and virtual assistants going forward will be because there's going to be around a 50% shift in productivity and efficiency if these are deployed and used well. So I want to stop you there and get you to think about this next question. I'm going to jump past that. Here. OK. In your own brokerage firms or the work that you do. And I know that the high human touch is so important for your customers and why you do such good business. We know that. But what is it, do you think, if you had a machine that could support you, a virtual assistant, what could they do? What could the machines, what could artificial intelligence perhaps automate that would either make your business more efficient help you sell more, or give your customers a, a better customer experience. So I'd love you to have a chat to the person next to you, same person ideally that you spoke to before. Let's just go one minute on, where do you think artificial intelligence, robotics, automation, virtual assistants could actually help you in your business? Let's just do it hypothetically. 
where do you think the best application of that would be? Let's go one minute, we'll have a quick chat. One minute each, have a chat about that. Okay, let's come back again to, um, to be together as a group. And I'm super interested in hearing anyone who would like to share with, with the group here today where you think virtual assistants so there's a lot of super keenness down in this front row right here. Um, where you think it might be useful, why don't you, um, yeah, do you want to go and then the gentleman next to you. Hey, Greg, back again. Hey, Greg. Everything that deals with the lender, all those phone calls, chasing the valuation, <laughs> where's my formal approval, who did you post yeah. the docs to? They, they can talk to the lender, I'll talk to the customer. Yeah, nice. Who else agrees that that's a good idea? Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, great, brilliant, thanks, Greg. Hi, who are you, where do you come from? James from Sydney. Hey, James. I was just going to say the broker fact find is obviously an area where people can populate that with the help of, a, yeah. of artificial intelligence. That'd be yeah. great. Fantastic. Anybody else? Come down here. Um, yes, we often have not much information coming through from the lenders and our clients want more information. They want something maybe every day, every two days and we're sitting there waiting for a week. So if we get a bot to call them and give them a reassurance call any questions and kind of distract them, find out more, teach them more, just to keep them occupied while we're waiting. <laughs> That's a great idea to me. I think we had one more down, down here. Thank you. Hello, my name's Giles from Melbourne. Giles. Um, and I've got quite an IT background for many years, but I'll see this will all evolve very quickly so that the bots will do all the main mundane tasks and really just present us with any problems which need to be yeah. resolved. Yeah. All the IDing of clients is all being, systems are now automating. Yeah. Document sign-ups is all being done electronically shortly. There's still one or two steps they've got to fix, mm. but we won't need to go see the clients. Um, so really, the, the bots will just simply present the higher stuff for us to fix, and everything else will be resolved. And Correct. that's only probably four or five years away. Yeah, if, if, if sooner. Yeah. yeah, beautiful. Thank you, Charles. And that is just a beautiful segue into just the final thought I want to leave you with. So, so my, my PhD was in um, machines replacing human leaders in the workplace. It sounds all a bit sort of scary. And when we think of bots, um, when I was saying to Rob that when um, I was trying to get an icon for Rosie and I went sort of half human, half machine, and I, I sort of... Um, we crowdsourced a design for it. It either came back as sexy bot or terminator bot. There, were, there wasn't anything in the middle. But what I want you all to know that those of us who are sort of just sitting behind thinking of these things and building these machines, we're not building them to do the terminator thing. We're not building them to take over the world. We're really not. A lot of us are thinking philosophically about how the coming of AI can help humans be more human. So if we look at a couple of the philosophers that I've put up here, so Aristotle um, talks about what is the purpose of being human. And the purpose of the human, uh, he talks uh, about a number of things in the, in the fourth century. It was to be happy, to be successful, to live well, to succeed, to be an individual, but when we look at the analysis of Aristotle's work by other philosophers, they really land on the most important thing that humans can do to be truly human is to flourish. And the way people can and humans can flourish is by being freed to do higher purpose work. And when we look at um, Nietzsche, he says... As another philosopher, there is nothing better than to do what is good, and that is to understand that you have a capacity and a potential in this world and to use it and thereby flourish. So my last thing I want to leave you with is simply that, that the machines we hope can really start to free humans up, whether it's um, answering <laughs> and dealing with lenders or it is actually um, providing information after hours to your customers so that you can actually do more human work. That's really where we believe and we hope that it will go. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for talking about this uh, topic with me today. Thanks.